A very warm welcome to this session of the 30th Alumni Festival. Today, in association with the Hay Festival, we'll be discussing the topic of AI in the workplace and what it means for equality. We're just going to wait a few more moments while uh, all our attendees arrive. As I'm sure we're all aware, the COVID-19 epidemic has already brought about major changes to many of our professional lives, from chaotic Zoom meetings, more flexible working hours, and more extensive collaboration with colleagues scattered across the UK and indeed around the world. But will the changes be sustained once the epidemic is hopefully under control? And what sort of impact will this have on the kind of work we do and who does it? How will this affect social mobility, access to employment? And will it make the professional world more or less equal? And finally, how will these changes intersect with the growing and seemingly unstoppable deployment of AI across numerous fields? To answer these questions and more, I'm joined today by Dr. Helen McCarthy, Dr. Christopher Marco, Dr. St Dr. Stella Pachidi, and Professor Neil Lawrence. We'll begin with a short series of short presentations from each of our panelists before moving on to Q&A. However, I would invite the audience to submit Q&A throughout the, throughout the talk, and we'll get around to the answering them shortly. However, please do make it clear when you're asking questions in the chat window, which speaker you're asking a question to. That'll make our lives a lot easier if we have a clear idea of who the questions are being addressed to. I'll do my best once the speakers have all finished their presentations to address as many audience questions as possible, but we may not be able to answer all of them. Please note also that this event is being recorded and will be uploaded onto the university's Dear World, Yours Cambridge YouTube page later in October. Whether you're joining us for the first time or have already sampled from the smorgasbord of fascinating panels and lectures we've already had at the Alumni Festival, I'm sure you're in for a treat. To start things off, I now turn to Dr. Helen McCarthy. Dr. Helen McCarthy is a university reader in modern and contemporary British history at St. John's College. Her research focuses on the social, cultural and political history of Britain. She's the author of numerous publications and three books, namely The British People in the League of Nations, uh, Women of the World, which examines the role of women in British diplomatic, di British diplomatic culture, and most recently, Double Lives, a History of Working Motherhood. So to kick us off, over to you, Helen. There we go, try again. Hello everyone. Uh, I'm going to kick us off with a very brief history of homeworking to provide some kind of context, a bit of a long view on the topic that we're discussing this afternoon. So I'm going to take you back to the early 18th century, the era just before the Industrial Revolution in Britain. And here homeworking was pervasive in the sense that the household as a site for production was an integral feature of the economy. Here is where brewing, baking and spinning took place. Uh, it's where crop, crops were tended and cattle grazed. It's where goods and services were produced either for the market or for consumption by household members. And if we look at our first slide, we've got an illustration here of some spinning going on uh, inside a domestic workshop. And this is, this is from the early 19th century. Uh, and the use of outworkers, as they were known at the time, was a very common feature of small scale industry. Uh, I'm thinking of industries like clothing manufacture, glove making, nail and chain making. And this kind of waged labor did not disappear with the rise of the factory system. Uh, I think we tend to assume that industrialization brought about a very sharp separation of the workplace from the home in the 19th century. But in fact, a great deal of waged labor continued to take place inside it, often carried out by women, including many married women uh, with small children who were not able to take a full-time job in the factory. And this work was typically very low paid. And if we go to the next slide, uh, we can see an image of a home working mother. Uh, and this was actually a propaganda image produced by agitators who were campaigning against so-called sweated homework uh, in the early 20th century. And a very striking feature of this kind of homework, which is relevant to today's topic, is its labor intensive character. So this kind of homework was not associated with automation. Uh, most home workers had very basic tools. Some tailoresses acquired sewing machines uh, towards the end of the 19th century, but that was about as high tech as it got. And indeed, the availability of a large pool of low wage labor in the home served as a disincentive to employers who might otherwise have invested uh, in more expensive plants and machinery. 
Now, I want to jump forward very briefly and crudely to the late 20th century, when in fact the picture looks fairly similar for those doing this kind of industrial homework. And we can see some images of late 20th century home workers on the next slide. Uh, the use of, of homework um, uh, surged again from the 1970s to the 1990s, particularly in the clothing industry, as UK manufacturers sought to compete with low wage economies elsewhere. It was work which many uh, migrant women did, particularly women from South Asia, often working for Asian uh, clothing businesses, um, small businesses, uh, supplying the large retail chains. And there was quite a lot of uh, concern, as there had been in the Edwardian period, in Parliament and amongst grassroots activists around this kind of, of low-paid, sweated labour. But these decades also saw the form, the growth of a form of white-collar homework, which is more familiar to us in our COVID age. So developments in information and communication technologies meant that it became increasingly possible for some professionals to work remotely. Um, and if we move to the next slide, uh, here's an image of such a teleworker as they were known. These are workers who rely on a computer and a telephone line in the home to work remotely. Uh, and in fact, we see this first being embraced by the tech industry itself. So computer programmers, systems analysts being set up uh, with network terminals in their homes. And again, it's mostly married women who are doing this kind of off-site work, uh, reflecting the lack of childcare and the existing sexual divisions uh, in the home. And this is an image from a pamphlet uh, in 1984, which found that most of these new home workers were in fact married women uh, who were doing it in order to fit in with childcare responsibilities. As the 1980s and 1990s wore on, however, working from home was embraced by a wider range of white collar workers, including many men, including the self-employed who were more likely to have uh, a computer at home, which they could use for work purposes. Um, and in the late 1990s, I found a sort of fairly reliable statistic to suggest that there were about 900,000 such teleworkers, making up about 4% of the workforce. Uh, and if we move on to the next slide, um, these are just some of the images that um, appear when you Google working from home. And I think this sort of indicates how actually this type of home working, uh, telework, uh, is associated with a, a much more sort of aspirational techno-utopian uh, kind of imagery. There's a sort of vision of post-industrial modernity, I think, swirling around telework uh, from the later 20th century. This idea that these new technologies can transform our homes, our family life, our communities for the better. And I think if we jump forward to 2020, and this is sort of my final, my final two points really, um, we might argue that some of that promise has finally been realized. Uh, the global pandemic has certainly engendered a step change in how we work. Before the virus, working from home was definitely an established pattern, but it was still only a minority of the workforce, perhaps 15% uh, who were working from home on a regular basis. And there was still a great deal of cultural resistance in many workplaces to home working. While employers have had to change their attitude, they've had to embrace uh, the opportunities for remote working, which actually the technology has been available uh, to deliver for quite some time. And I think it's clear from some of the research that's been undertaken since the lockdown that many people really appreciate the flexibility that they get from home working and are enjoying not having to commute. But my very final point uh, would be just to issue a word of caution here, because based on past experience, we know that home working socially isolates with negative outcomes uh, for mental health. This is a particularly true for women who are housebound with young children. And one other point from an industrial relations perspective, it's very difficult to organize a dispersed home-based workforce in order to resist exploitation. And we can see that from 19th century sweated home working as well as sweated home working in the later 20th century. And we're beginning to see it with the precarious digital home workers of the 21st century. So people who take on work paid by the piece through crowd work platforms such as Amazon Mechanical Turk. And if we sort of just move on to the next, my final slide. Um, and this is an article, an excellent article 
from the FT just this week by Sarah O'Connor, who writes a lot about these issues. Um, and she talks about the, the growth of this kind of digital homeworking uh, in which we can see homework, new technologies and precarious labor being bundled together in extremely worrying ways. So on that rather gloomy note, uh, I will finish, uh, finish my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Helen. Uh, very valuable to have a historical perspective on these, these issues and remember that uh, homeworking as a phenomenon is not something new that we're experiencing from the first time, but something that has taken many forms over the years and perhaps holds some lessons for us as a society. I uh, particularly like the slides, the promotional images of what homeworking was like, since speaking as someone with two young children at home who's been homeworking along with my wife who's also been homeworking, I thought they failed to really capture the particularly dynamic chaos of the homeworking has, uh, has manifested itself in, uh, in, in recent years. Maybe a few more spilled coffee cups, scattered Lego, that, that would be a bit more accurate. Wonderful, so turning now from historical to more legally focused perspectives, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Christopher Marco. Dr. Christopher Marco is a Levy Hume Fellow and lecturer in the Faculty of Law at the University of Cambridge, Associate at the Cambridge Centre for Business Research, Director of the AI Law and Society LLM at King's College London, and Fellow of the Royal Society of the Arts. He writes widely on emerging technologies, policy and governance, with work featured in outlets such as Scientific American, Newsweek and Wired, amongst others. Christopher has been a keynote speaker at the Cheltenham Science Festival, Cambridge Festival of Ideas, TED Talks and the World Congress on Information Technology. He's co-editor of the forthcoming volume, Is Law Computable? Critical Perspectives on Law and Artificial Intelligence, and author of the forthcoming monograph, Lex Ex Machina, From Rule of Law to Legal Singularity. Over to you, Christopher. Hi, everybody. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Coming through. Wonderful. Nice. So the the title of my so uh, it, I I, I want to take the, the the job of being the really depressing one because the title of my talk today is what we lose by automating justice and with the issue of homeworking and changes to how we work and what kind of work is done. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what might happen if uh, people like me, uh, lawyers, uh, might go the way of the dinosaur. What we might lose in the process. So uh, you barely can go a day now without encountering some kind of bold claim about the disruptive potential of AI. You see things like Boston Dynamics Atlas here, and this obviously perpetuates this kind of like creeping dread that the machines are coming for our jobs. And of course, this is not a new fear. This is a long-standing fear. The difference this time, I think, is that it's not just the blue-collar jobs, the kind of jobs that if you go to Cambridge, you don't want, but the ones that you go to Cambridge for, like being a lawyer that might also be at risk. But for all of the technical achievements that we could talk about, and certainly Britain has been a leading figure in them, I think that one of the most uh, prestigious and certainly one of the most uh, important accomplishments has been the creation and the development of English common law. Uh, to spare you the history of the development of the law, it was a revolution to be able to have a system that allowed not just the king to dictate laws, but judges and lawyers to interpret laws and indeed reinterpret them to suit new times and circumstances and reflect the world as it is, not as it was. But of course, lawyers aren't the most popular people. I've heard most of the jokes. Uh, Stephen King said that we should be classed in the natural history of monsters. John Keats said that we were the flies on the hide of humanity. So I totally get that people might not miss lawyers, but I'm gonna try my best to make a case for what we might lose. Now, of course, law is a traditionally upper class profession. You go to places like Cambridge to become a lawyer. It's largely composed of white guys wearing, of course, white wigs. Um, so there is a lot to be to take issue with about law as an institution and how it's administered. But I think its importance to society is something that is really threatened by automation and all these sort of uh, encroachment of algorithmic tools, which I'll detail for you today. Indeed, for all the enthusiasm around AI, none of this is new. We have been here before and people that have been in this research field much longer than I have will tell you that the enthusiasm that people have about liberating us from the tyranny of work, we've heard before. We've heard it specifically in law. In 1980, scholars like Elthorne McCartney saw law as a data-rich and intensive domain that was ripe 
for an artificial intelligence approach. At the time, these systems weren't called AI, they were called legal expert systems, but the idea was the same. You could develop an algorithm by feeding it the law, by inputting facts, and out would come a decision and judgment. It was this really mechanistic view of the law simply as rules, and the humans deciding things and interpreting things, doing little more than sort of parsing out facts mechanically. If we fast forward to the present, we see legal scholars still making the same claims. This is Eugene Volek from UCLA, who proposes something akin to a legal Turing test, stating that if an entity writes judicial opinions well enough, we should accept it. Now, I take issue with this because I tell, tell my students every year that law is not just outputs, it's the process through which we make decisions, how we carry ourselves as legal professionals, that really matters. The process is the exercise in law, and the people making decisions have to adhere to professional conduct and numerous rules that bind what they do and how they do it. So we don't call it legal expert systems anymore. We call it legal tech, short for legal technology, of course. It is one of a number of techs along with GovTech, RegTech, FinTech, which are all fancy words for just trying to automate processes within those specific domains. In law, we've seen a sort of boom of these technologies in everything from contract drafting to discovery, to predicting the outcomes of cases, to assessing the risk of litigation. And the UK is a real hotbed of development for this, uh, particularly as it remains the sort of de facto hub of global commerce. So the UK government has made it a priority to incentivize the development of what it calls next generation services which is particularly important when you consider that law, accountancy, and insurance account for about 80% of the UK economy. And one of the particular things that uh, legal tech researchers are trying to do is predict the future. We've seen a sort of glut of efforts to predict the outcome of Supreme Court cases, the European Court of Human Rights, and various other national jurisdictions. And at face value, this sounds very exciting whenever you see statistics about, oh, a machine can predict outcomes of cases, but there's something very insidious about using the past only over and over again to make the same decision in the present. I think that the risk here, if you use a machine learning approach, is that you will, instead of having this flexibility and interpretability that comes with law, that is a function of language, you will over time sort of like ossify a very narrow conception of what legal concepts are. Things like reasonableness, duty of care, good faith, these really woolly concepts that are always subject to interpretation and reinterpretation, all of a sudden they become really computationally stable reference. But the other thing about predicting the outcome of cases is that oftentimes, as with the case with the Supreme Court, you don't really need to know more than a judge's political affiliation to guess how they might decide a case. So I think that this is really concerning in the sense that the claim that you are predicting the outcome of a case can easily become the decision in a case, depending on how much confidence you put in it. We've seen similar things happen in policing, particularly in the US, where algorithms have been used to give custody sergeants information as to whether an offend offender should be jailed or bailed. Paradoxically, the most well-known of these systems, Compass, uh, has been found to be mathematically flawed and has this pernicious habit of recommending harsher sentences for minority defendants than white defendants with longer criminal histories and larger or more serious offenses. So what this does under the sort of guise of algorithmic or computational rationality is say, well, we, we can institutionalize and entrench all of these social biases, these things that have developed over centuries and just sort of ossify them and legitimize them. If a racist society and a racist people create an algorithm based upon a history of racist policing data, we shouldn't expect the output to be anything other than, well, racist. In the UK, we've seen what happens when we let algorithms decide students' grades. Indeed, some of you may well have kids on the way to university and hopefully wanting to attend Cambridge someday. But again, we see what happens when you use a one model fits all approach to things like a deeply individualized matter like your grades. But perhaps the most egregious example of what happens when you cut human decision makers out of the loop comes from Australia. In 2016, the Australian government launched a program called Centrelink and decided to automate the reconciliation of debt payments. Now, it didn't just automate identifying who might have owed money, it automated posting letters out to them 
whereas the government might send out about 20,000 letters in a given year. Between January to July 2016, it sent out about 169,000 letters to people, often on spurious bases, requesting information that the Australian Taxation Office doesn't require citizens to hold. And it resulted in this weird situation where it reversed the burden of proof, whereby people had to defend themselves against an automated accusation that they had owed the government money. This obviously was a gigantic catastrophe down under. The Centrelink program, also known as RoboDebt, has since been scrapped, but the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights has said that this seems to be tantamount to a digital welfare dystopia. When you take individuals out of the loop of decision making and you see people not as individual cases to be treated with humanity and with, you know, uh, with individual discretion, but you see them as a cluster of data points, you dehumanize individuals and you lead to, well, outcomes like we've seen in Australia. But it doesn't stop there. Last year, Estonia announced that it was using an AI judge to determine small claims cases of less than 7,000 euro. But in China, we already have three fully automated online courts complete with AI judges and digital avatars, which allowed litigants to use things like WeChat to upload evidence and receive verdicts back through the app. Of course, in a country like China, where there is a huge population and you have to manage a large amount of people in cases, efficiency helps and things like this go a long way. But there is pushback. In France, well, they passed a law prohibiting the use of these kind of data analytic techniques to model judges or predict what they might do. It is now illegal in France, subject to a five-year criminal or custodial penalty if you try and do this. So we're starting to see a little bit of pushback that may be throwing AI and computation at more and more aspects of our lives really has an insidious effect. But I think if you're like me and you need a, a more sort of down to earth example to really understand these things, I think we can just look to football. Now I, full discretion, I'm a gigantic Manchester United fan, but if you are not a football fan, video assistant referee was a, a project that first started in the 2018 World Cup, but essentially it uses cameras and computers to assist on field referees in making decisions and things like offside, goal or no goal, uh, mistaken identity. And in principle, it was supposed to really help level the playing field and make it easier for referees to adjudicate games. Kinda hasn't gone that way, unfortunately. Perhaps the best example was the 2018 Champions League semi-final, where in the dying throws, Raheem Sterling scored a late winner only to have it overturned. And in one of the most glorious YouTube clips, you can see the agony and ecstasy of Manchester City fans all at once. The goal was overturned, City crashed out. And, well, it hasn't really gotten better. In fact, VAR seems to have accomplished something in European football. It's united football fans around the idea that VAR sucks. It doesn't seem to work, but it does. In fact, VAR works precisely as advertised. Slow motion, multi-angled replays allow referees to see things that they can't see with their eyes. Of course, this is going to allow us to be able to make decisions with granularity that we can't do in real time. So why do we hate it? Well, I think it really touches on a sort of intuitive idea we all have that there is a letter to the law that you might be able to make computable, but there's also this thing called a spirit to the law. And we don't want a rigid adherence to the letter of the law any more than we want an unfettered adherence to the spirit of the law. We want something in between those two. And in closing, the sort of crux of my research and what I'm interested in is to try and compare what makes language, uh, oral language, better suited to the, being the medium through which law is conducted, and what happens when we try to squeeze out human decision makers and discretion from core areas of our society, like the courts. So I'll close with this, which is the sort of uh, orienting question of my research. Where do we stop? What are the red lines for this? And I think that one of the things that we have missed in all this excitement and enthusiasm around AI is any serious deliberation on where are the no-go zones? Where what aspects of life are simply too sensitive or too important to allow a machine 
devoid of scrutiny that might be a proprietary algorithm makes such consequential decisions like what grade you get, what mortgage you get, what job you get, or where you go to school. So in closing, I will give myself, of course, a plug and say that I have a book on this very subject coming out uh, with uh, some of the leading scholars at the intersection of law and technology where we try to unpick these questions by straddling uh, legal theory and computational theory to really answer the question, what's better as the medium of law, numbers or words? So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Christopher, for that fantastic overview of the uh, moral dilemmas involved in uh, automating legal processes. I'm sure many of us uh, lay people without knowledge of the law find law daunting and Byzantine enough at the best of times, but uh, there's a, a moment of uh, a definite joy when one finally manages to make contact with a human in dealing with legal processes. And the idea that those humans may be cut out of the loop altogether or that we might be stuck dealing with a computer saying no indefinitely in legal decisions is a bit of a Kafka-esque nightmare. So uh, we're grateful for advocates like you fighting back against this to some extent. Okay, for our third speaker, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stella Pakidi uh, to, be discu to discuss um, uh, work, the workplace and automation and algorithms. Um, Dr. Stella Pakidi is a lecturer in information systems at the University of Cambridge Judge Business School. Her research interests lie at the intersection of technology, work and organizing, and she's written extensively for both popular and academic audiences on topics like automation, AI and the future of jobs, and the role of algorithms in the workplace. Her current research focuses on the introduction of algorithmic technologies such as analytics and AI in organizations, managing challenges in the workplace with digitization, and practices of knowledge collaboration across boundaries. Over to you, Stella. Thank you very much, uh, Henry, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, so, um, uh, my presentation will focus mainly on uh, um, how AI uh, technology has been affecting work. Uh, and I will start by um, uh, saying uh, definitely the debate on the impact of AI on work has changed uh, lately. Um, it's less on the economic uh, consequences and uh, what kind of jobs will be lost. Uh, because we know that this is probably going to take uh, quite a few years till we fully automate everything. But instead, right now, what, what has become particularly interesting is to better understand how the nature of work is changing as we introduce those technologies in the workplace. Uh, if I could go to the next slide. Um, I would uh, say, yeah. first of all, uh, if, you, if we look at AI, um, uh, be because it has uh, 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 at least the, uh, with the latest technology, with the latest developments, the technology is able to um, um, imitate uh, human judgment quite sufficiently without requiring uh, the, uh, uh, the need of a, of a human expert. Uh, it is different in this way from other technologies that has been introduced in the workplace because it now particularly affects uh, the work of knowledge uh, workers. Uh, look, for example, at the work of doctors. Uh, as I said, um, uh, we don't really see any radiologists, for example, being replaced uh, anytime soon. However, um, uh, AI has been penetrating their workplace and it has been affecting how they perform their diagnosis. Uh, colleagues of mine have been doing research uh, specifically on this, in this field and they have been seeing how radi radiologists have been doubting um, uh, their own judgment because they are affected uh, by the recommendations made by the AI machine that is uh, supporting their work. Similarly, to connect to Christopher's uh, uh, presentation, it's quite interesting to see as AI is uh, uh, being introduced uh, uh, in the work of lawyers, uh, the junior lawyers are uh, struggling with finding new ways uh, to develop their expertise and learn their work because the repetitive tasks that they used to perform are uh, the ones that are uh, being taken over uh, by, um, uh, by the, uh, the, the legal technologies, the, the law tech. So we need to pay a particular attention to the algorithms uh, behind uh, the AI technology and how they affect knowing. Uh, because first of all, they, they, um, they in, uh, represent knowledge in a very different way from how we used to uh, considering. So they look at knowledge as the outcome of algorithmic transformations uh, of decontextualized and uh, digitized and quantified information. 
So when we introduce the, such technologies, they, we, we actually introduce new paradigms in the workplace and the, such paradigms turn our attention to different types of information and different types of objects uh, compared to what the worker um, um, used to um, uh, work with. Uh, for example, if you look at a salesperson, um, a salesperson would uh, focus on their relationships, they would focus on the people that they are in contact with, uh, but when you bring in uh, an AI system uh, to automate part of the sales process, the attention is more to the transactional data that is stored in uh, databases. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, um, uh, so um, those algorithmic technologies uh, not only affect how we come to know, they actually affect also what matters in the workplace. They affect um, what kind of knowledge is rendered more valuable. And uh, um, uh, this, this creates, uh, um, uh, uh, this can create quite some disruption, uh, uh, let's say disruption and contestation in the work. So for example, uh, um, it affects how the workers are evaluated or um, it uh, brings in uh, dilemmas about whether we should trust more uh, the human that uh, uh, makes a decision uh, versus the decision that is uh, uh, predicted uh, by uh, the machine. And they appear to increase uh, objectivity uh, because uh, we're supposed to rely on quantitative uh, modeling without taking into consideration, uh, however, uh, the fact that uh, um, the, there is a human that has uh, developed some algorithm uh, in the, uh, uh, the some, uh, they have imbued certain decision criteria and certain valuation schemes within uh, the algorithm as much as there are uh, data that have been generated by humans that are processed by the AI and that affect um, uh, its, uh, um, 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 uh, the outcomes uh, that it predicts. Uh, it's, uh, if, if you look at those uh, human biases that are behind the technology, it uh, is less surprising to see how, for example, a Facebook algorithm would be found to actively pro promote uh, fake news. Uh, and uh, um, other ideas. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, um, because new types of expertise and new types of knowledge are rendered valuable, it's interesting to see that the authority arrangements also change. Uh, look at the, uh, the boards of businesses nowadays, uh, they're increasingly, you see more and more the chief digital officer or chief data officer role uh, in the board. So that definitely means something. And um, uh, there's uh, um, um, a lot of uh, um, um, uh, friction about new types of technology practitioners uh, that enter the workplace, like data scientists, um, um, machine learning specialists, et cetera, who have the expertise to process large amounts of data, to write complex algorithms. And that kind of expertise becomes more and more valuable in the workplace. So those kinds of people in, uh, get increasingly more and more authority um, uh, affecting how the work is done and how uh, um, the expertise of others uh, comes to matter, um, et cetera. So, uh, but interestingly, uh, those kinds of people, they black box usually the design choices uh, in the decision-making procedures. So uh, 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 the uh, human who interacts with the technology quite often is not uh, able to uh, bypass it and to affect how, um, uh, to affect the final choice. Uh, what becomes also particularly interesting is how those algorithmic technologies enable a new mode of organizing, what we may call, let's say, as the uberization of the workplace. And that comes with new types of control, the, this kind of algorithmic control where the employees are managed by an algorithm rather than by a human boss. And I think it's a, a, a we, we have started seeing and we will be seeing more and more counter performances where humans still try to find a way to fight uh, this system, even if it feel, even though it may feel uh, like a, a digital uh, iron cage. So um, I have this uh, picture here of the mobile phones hanging from the tree. Uh, these are phones that have been hanged there by Amazon drivers. Uh, who uh, put their phones there trying to 
uh, uh, get more drives uh, um, uh, from whole foods because they they saw that the the distance affects uh, um, the 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 drives that they would get on their phones. So especially with the pandemic, uh, they had less uh, uh, drives to do as humans, and uh, transferring food obviously uh, proved uh, um, uh, a better deal. So they tried to um, um, uh, play, let's say, uh, with the numbers, play with the algorithm in order to get uh, more work. And finally, uh, uh, in my next slide, I have a couple of uh, quotes uh, from uh, my own research uh, where, I study, uh, where I studied the introduction of uh, um, an algorithmic technology in uh, a sales organization. Um, and uh, uh, what I saw there was an epistemic contestation uh, about uh, all those issues about uh, how you come to know which values matter, who has the authority. And I think uh, those kinds of epistemic contestations, we will be seeing them more and more. I have been uh, give, uh, uh, already getting a lot of feedback uh, from practitioners who are seeing similar struggles about uh, knowledge in the workplace. And uh, we need to figure out how we manage those struggles. Uh, otherwise, it could get out of hand. People could, could just, uh, um, um, symbolically adopt uh, the technology thinking that okay well i'm gonna play this game i will pretend that i work with the algorithm uh, i will pretend that uh, i base my decisions upon it and uh, we get to see that in this way those technologies become legitimized but we haven't really um, tested them we haven't really seen how they can they actually affect uh, uh, the decision-making processes, and it can uh, lead to several unintended consequences. In my case, uh, in the sales organization, the sales employees, uh, they pretended to use uh, the algorithmic technology, and eventually that rendered them redundant, and they all lost uh, uh, their jobs. Uh, but uh, the organization did lose something. They did lose the expertise that those people have and the personal relationship that they had with their customer. It just became less valuable anymore. Uh, I think I should probably stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, Henry, I will pass to you. Thank you so much. I've had a start off that fantastic, uh, fantastic overview. Um, it's scary and sort of exciting to think about the way that these hidden patterns and data can, use, can be used by businesses to better uh, direct advertising or products towards their customers. Recently, I was surprised to see that Amazon had apparently become convinced that I was about to start a brand new hobby in the form of beekeep beekeeping, advertising large amounts of beekeeping equipment to me. And even <laughs> scarier was the fact that I'd actually, without, as far as I know, making any online query, started to think that beekeeping might be an interesting hobby. So definitely some subtle patterns there that they'd picked up on. Thank for, you our final, Thank you. for our final speaker, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Neil Lawrence, who is the DeepMind Professor of Machine Learning at the University of Cambridge in the Department of Computer Science and Technology. He's co-host of Talking Machines podcast and a visiting professor at the University of Sheffield. He has extensive experience in machine learning in both industry and in academia. And from 2016 to 2019, he was director of machine learning at Amazon. So without further ado, introducing a speaker who I'm sure will have all sorts of inside insights for us. Uh, a very big welcome to Professor, Steel, uh, professor Neil Lawrence. Over to you, Neil. Thank you, Henry. Um, and, and thanks to everyone who's spoken so far. I've really enjoyed hearing such a diversity of perspectives on artificial intelligence. So, so my own background is, as Henry said, as a machine learning researcher, and I've been doing that for about 20 years. And I guess it, it's gone from being a technology we were working on to one that is widespread everywhere. It's basically what everyone's calling artificial intelligence. So I've, I've ended up moving towards trying to explain a little bit about what I think the social phenomena are behind AI. Although I was working on the algorithms, I became very interested in uh, what the effects of those algorithms were going to be. And, and I really want to start by harking back to Helen's talk, which I, I really enjoyed, particularly the images. And having spent the uh, best part of 20 years in, in Sheffield, where I was a professor before, um, the, the costume of Yorkshire in 1814, which is representing a sort of a bygone world that if you live in the north, um, it, it, it exists everywhere, it haunts the landscape. Um, and that world, as, as Helen so beautifully described, was, was often based around this mix between homeworking and uh, an emerging industrial society. 
Um, we used to cycle down to Cromford, which is the sort of birth of Arkwright's factory system. And, and, and that's all based around these ideas Helen was talking about. So, so I was at Amazon for three years, as, as Henry said. And I, I was at, at Amazon not because I was interested in working on uh, funky AI systems, like uh, these new intelligent systems, but I was really, really interested in, I think, one of the most important things that surrounds us, and that is the supply chain. And I ended up deploying machine learning solutions in supply chain. You might think, well, supply chain, that, that can't be very interesting. But one of the things we saw with Stella's presentation was, was the way that different groups at different times were either being victimized or liberated by their home working conditions. And I think that that's a super important point because the repressions on those workers that are emerging from economic forces. And those are the pressures that home workers experience. So I want to just talk a little bit about how what we call artificial intelligence is affecting those pressures and, and, and how we should be aware of what the future is going to look like. And what I wanted to mention was something that my colleague, uh, Narayan Venkata Subramanian at Amazon once told me. He, he'd been in supply chain his whole, whole career and you know, he, he was towards the end of a career and, and Amazon was his last spin. And he once said to me, and it's wonderful, he was from Bombay, and this wonderful deep uh, resonant voice that I, that I can't do. So, so you have to imagine me saying this in, in a beautiful deep resonant voice that almost sounds like a god. He said, well, the biggest change that occurred over the 20th century is the switch from a push supply chain to a pull supply chain. So, so what does he mean by that? Well, he, he went on to describe, he said, look, if you manufacture something at the end of the Second World War, you could sell it to anyone. I mean, and there's this boon in the number of different vehicles people are making and selling because there was a shortage of manufacturing. And the biggest shift we saw you know, occurring around the 50s and 60s and 70s, as you gain more and more manufacturers, was because the power is with those who are manufacturing initially, but then when you have an oversupply of manufacturers, because more and more countries become industrialized and get involved, the power shifts to the distributor. So the distributor now has a choice of places they can go, and they have a choice of people they can do business with. And this applies pressure on the manufacturers or the farmers or whoever the suppliers is. Supply chain is about matching supply to demand. And there are sort of three components. There's the demand, what people want. There's the supply, what people are making. And then there's the transport logistics infrastructure for matching those. And what we saw was a massive shift from the power being with manufacturers to the power being with distributors, big supermarkets, Amazon itself, Walmart, the people that control the market, that control the distribution. And that stuck with me a lot. It's, it stuck with me because I was reading a profile of John McDonnell, our former shadow chancellor. And at some point he wrote, well, you know, I have to say I'm an old fashioned Marxist at heart. Uh, you know, at heart, I believe um, that we should be controlling the means of production. Well, how dumb is that if no one's making any money out of production? Because what Marx was on about is the value is being created in manufacturing. He's talking about an era when the manufacturers were in charge. And actually the shift we've seen is they aren't in charge. You control the means of production, you control the people who are on the smallest margins, who are having to work extremely hard to distribute their goods just in time. The value is all being made in distribution. So the modern marks would be control the means of distribution. So how does AI and machine learning affect that? Well, today we're seeing a further shift. One thing is to control demand. But what if you go all the way to the so, so supply? What if you go all the way to the other side and you try to control demand? What if you can manipulate what people want? What if you can steer them to buy things that they didn't formally want? Well, that's the modern way of making money. Of course, it's called advertising, but what the internet allows, and let's be very clear, that this isn't a story about artificial intelligence. This is a story about a massively interconnected world where information is flowing very rapidly. All AI is, is a set of algorithms that make people able to make decisions on the back of that data. And what the companies that are making the most money at the moment are doing is advertising to you. And they make very, very large profits through that. Because if you can control demand, that's way better than controlling supply or distribution. And that's the big shift we see to the future of work. Now, what can we do about it? Well, of course, the raw material, one, the clever bit about Marx is he's saying, well, the value is actually coming from the worker. 
So you have to do things to empower the workers. And whether you believe in communism, which I certainly am not a communist myself, it's certainly true that you need to rebalance the equation to ensure that everything is not controlled by the person who owns the mill. You need to ensure that the workers have rights. So you get workers' rights. So what's the modern equivalent of that? Well, that's data rights. And these aren't new. Um, in fact, they go back to this book called The Assault on Privacy with this wonderful quote. Today's laser technology already makes it feasible to store a 20-page dossier on every American on a piece of tape that is less than 5,000 feet long. It's written by a guy called Arthur Miller. It's published in 1970. Already then they realized the power of information, but they did not have this interconnected world. Now, we already have legislation in this space, and it's got the most appalling name ever because it's called data protection legislation. But if you look back to the original legislation, the original title, and I have to read it because I never remember it, is the Convention for the Protection of Individuals with regard to the automatic processing of personal data. And that's what you need protecting against. Now, the unfortunate thing is the assault on privacy and the, what people thought about then was all about consequential decision making. The decisions are being made about you to about legal decision making. It applies to that. It applies to whether you get to go to university or not. It applies to whether you get a loan or not. But the big thing in terms of the modern era is the inconsequential decision making of all the things you're shown on Facebook, your news feed, your Twitter feed, the adverts you're shown, none of which you gain many rights about. And the only way we can regain those rights is to strengthen our own personal data rights and bring them together, collectivize in order to battle against them. So I think that that is going to be, that's the big trends in the future of AI, that you, it's all about where you see the value being created. And right now you're starting to see the value created in controlling the demand. And we need to reobtain that control of demand as personal citizens through reobtaining the control of our personal data. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that, Neil. I've got to say, I'm lucky in London being totally immune to any of these micro-targeted advertising, uh, advertising strategies. And the 17 or so gimmicky kitchen gadgets in, uh, that I have downstairs for peeling boiled eggs and making better souffles are entirely a product of my autonomous free will. Um, it's my pleasure now to uh, turn over um, discussion to some of the fantastic questions, with, questions we've been receiving from the audience. So to start us off with a quite a challenging, uh, almost philosophical question, a question to Dr. Um, Dr. Christopher Marco, Marco from uh, Brian Stoker. How do you decide what the facts are? So if two witnesses to an incident give different accounts, what's the fact? So if you'd like to comment more broadly on how uh, AI and the law goes about establishing the boundaries between fact versus opinion, that would be a, a thing of real interest. Sure. Um... I think we should be absolutely clear that there, you have to be careful about the language you use around AI. There's a lot of t tendency towards anthropomorphizing language and, and imbuing computers with capabilities and powers that I don't think is appropriate to apply. So the, there's the, the first ways that uh, researchers tried to approach this in the legal expert systems was the sort of logic-based approach, this, this idea that legal rules are kind of algorithms if you have a duty and you breach that duty and there are damages, and then there are damages and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of aspects of um, legal decision-making and legal reasoning that kind of are algorithmic like that. But all you can do, um, you, you cannot make a machine understand or intuit the law. Rather, you have to assign concrete and specific values to individual words. So if you think about a provision in a statute, you have to take a sort of rote mechanical approach to that. Now, in the 20th century, we, we kind of went through this uh, revolution in legal theory and philosophy that this sort of mechanistic approach to decision making, whereby you should rigorously apply rules uh, to facts to rules, um, would lead to a sort of absurdity that you, there would needed to be flexibility and discretion to determine uh, what was factual, what is opinion, but also how we interpret those facts. So what what is done now is, uh, now that we've moved on to the connectionist approach, is this idea that if we have access to this entire corpus of laws, and, and you know, in, in the UK we have laws going back to the 10th century, um, we have a data-rich domain that if we could analyze this rich corpus of material, we could kind of extract this essence that 
the law is there in the text waiting to be revealed. Um, I also think that's a really faulty approach because all of this turns on the idea that we know what we're looking for. And I see law not as this static system that should be stabilized, but something that evolves over time, something that has to be contested and that can only be seen as legitimate if there is capacity to quite literally tear it down if it no longer serves that purpose. Um, so I really resist uh, any sort of bold claims that machines understand what they are doing uh, or can can cognize uh, the kinds of things that go before lawyers and judges. It is a purely sort of brute force mechanistic approach. Fantastic, thank you, Christopher. A question now from Henry Lockwood um, to, uh, to Stella Pahidi. Uh, initial impulses have been to use digitization, including AI, to reduce costs or improve efficiencies. But how soon will we see a real shift using AI to add value to customers and organizations? I assume um, meaning adding value in a way that goes beyond simply uh, simply making things more efficient. Stella, would you like to take that question? Sure. Um, thanks, Henry. So um, I think that's that definitely is true. Uh, the the developments in AI they have uh, been uh, increasingly um, uh, enabling, let's say, organizations uh, to do things differently. Uh, I will connect with, so Neil talked a lot about uh, the data and information, and I think it, it comes down to that. The AI enables us to, uh, uh, to, to process the data that we have about our customers in a different way, and that means that we are able to find new ways uh, to create value uh, for them. So it has uh, increasingly enabled, let's say, what, what we could say basically new types of uh, business models. Uh, I, if I try to think of an example, I would probably think of uh, General Electric, uh, very interesting case of an organization that has been um, um, uh, trying uh, to go through this digital transformation where you see um, and I think it's not, it doesn't apply just to GE, it's a, it's a whole manufacturing industry, uh, basically where uh, the, 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 it, it is fundamentally uh, changing. It's not about producing engines anymore, it's about producing services and offering those services uh, to your customers, whether those are corporate customers in the case of GE or whether those are individual customers, where it's not a, anymore about just selling an artifact, but actually selling a service, selling an experience together with this artifact. So uh, processing data about maintaining uh, um, um, your equipment, for example, or uh, um, when it comes uh, to uh, uh, in individuals uh, processing data, let's say about uh, um, um, improving, let's say your, uh, uh, your teeth hygiene. I'm thinking of collecting data through the electric uh, toothbrush, for example. So uh, it's, it's interesting that um, organizations are really taking those, uh, all those technologies to create new types of value for their customers. And eventually that leads the organizations to connect with other firms uh, um, in, uh, uh, in new ways. And uh, um, eventually that, that comes to transform uh, the whole industry. I hope that answered Henry's question. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stella. Um, so a question now uh, for Neil Lawrence. Um, uh, from Julian Bolding, who asks, isn't the real change, um, I think this is referencing the sort of idea of, of shifting from a push to a pull economy, isn't the real change, asks Julian, um, that the empowered distributor, I assume people like Amazon, now also controls demand as well. Neil, do you have any thoughts on that? The, 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 the empowered distributor does control demand in some sense, which is because they get to point the fire hose. And that's kind of what has caused uh, companies like Walmart, like Amazon to be successful and uh, has put pressure on manufacturing prices, which is actually good for customers generally. So in some sense, I think that the worrying thing about when it's actually about steering demand itself is the businesses incentives are no longer aligned with their customers incentives. So advertising and marketing is clever when it's done at scale because you get people to do things that they didn't know they wanted to do or perhaps don't want to do. Now, when it's being done at scale based on your personal data, it's actually accessing foibles in your cognitive makeup that you didn't know you had. So I sometimes sort of 
make it akin to, you know, social media is, is the sort of cognitive equivalent of high fructose corn syrup. It's accessing things that, you know, uh, give you validation that are, are good as part of if you're in small groups, but they're, they're not perhaps good when done at scale. And it's using those types of things to manipulate you into interacting more and perhaps uh, doing things that, you, that are not in your personal interest. And I think that that's what the bigger danger is, but totally agree with the premise of the question. Yeah. And I, I think that the, the, what I'm sort of pointing out is that the future, it gets worse unless you regain this control of your personal data and get to make decisions calmly about whether you want that sort of thing to be happening to you. Of course, it should be your choice. I can just add on a question to that uh, briefly, Neil. Um, do you have any recommendations for things we could do as individuals? Obviously, there are societal things we can do to try and uh, try and regain some autonomy. But anything we can do as individuals? I mean, I'm thinking of perhaps things like uh, better uh, better use of things like VPNs, for example, or, or even just trying to confuse the algorithms sometimes, so just sharing Netflix accounts with multiple people. Are there anything think, more concrete we can do there? I think that, that, that those things are quite hard to do. Um, but the sort of thing we can do is the same thing we kind of try and do with food. Like, like I've learned that if you give me a packet of sweets, I will eat the whole thing, whatever my intention was. So I don't buy packets of sweets, you know. <laughs> and now, now, of course, occasionally I do indulge. But it, you can notice these things happening. And, and I would urge anyone who, who uses a mobile phone to think of the fact that sometimes they pick up their mobile phone to, to check their calendar. And then like half an hour later, they're on Facebook and they can't remember what they, why they picked up the phone and they're doing all these things. And it's because, you know, Facebook is using tricks to sort of, to interest you in it. Um, and I think that, that that just feels unhealthy. And I think that there's lots of things we can do as individuals to help us get out of that, including not doing those things in front of our children and helping educate our children that, that you know, those things are fine. There's a lot of good to them. I don't want to make it out it's all bad. But um, I mean, there's other stuff I think that, that, that will come out. But I think if you start getting too technical about it, then, then you'll just be on a computer trying to work out how to do it when you should just be outside enjoying social interaction with other people as much as possible when we don't have pandemics. Fantastic. Thank you, Neil. A question now for Helen from a, an anonymous question this time. Um, how has the shift to home working impacted gender equality in the workplace? Over to you, Helen. Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, this has been such a fascinating discussion and I've been just sort of trying to think through kind of how to connect up some of the some of the things that I'm interested in, which are really to do with the location of work, where work happens with um, some of the, the themes that, that other the other speakers have discussed around the impact of, of artificial intelligence. And um, I, I, I mean, it, it, it is very interesting to me how in the late 20th century, there was this sort of sense that, that information technology would, trans, would, would make it possible to transfer a different kind of work into the home, um, so the knowledge work that, that Stella was talking about. And I was very interested in what she said about how this creates new hierarchies within the workplace, so new sources of power and prestige. Um, a kind of shuffling within, you know, within organisations about who, you know, who's paid most, who's valued the most. And I was sort of trying to think that through in terms of, you know, how that affects my poor old, you know, m working mothers stuck at home with kids underfoot, trying desperately to keep their careers going. Um, and I do think it is, uh, you know, very kind of interesting and important to, to think about how far some of the dynamics that we're discussing about artificial intelligence will actually reinforce, potentially reinforce, reinforce that devaluing of women's labor in the home. Um, because, you know, in, in a sense, if we think about um, sweated homework in the 19th century, it, it was, it was piecework. I mean, what most of what, what women were doing, they were doing um, small tasks, which could be completed and repeated um, and picked up and put down throughout the day and they would then get paid by the piece. And it's very, very uh, fascinating to look at this emergence of digital piece working, essentially. Um, and uh, through uh, sites like Amazon Mechanical Turk, which I must admit, I, I knew nothing about until very recently. And the kind of piece work that those workers are doing, and often they're doing it from home because they don't have childcare, because they can't um, work outside the home on a full-time basis, because they need to earn extra money for the family. Um, you know, that, that, the kind of work they're doing are these very small um, administrative tasks, often sort of tagging objects in, image, in uh, images, uh, transcribing audio data, 
um, cleaning up databases for companies. Uh, and, you know, it was quite a revelation for me to, to discover that this kind of piecework has actually trans been transposed into the era of, uh, of, our, of, of AI and of, of data, of big data. So, I mean, to answer, to come back to your original question, um, I think we have to watch the gender dynamics of that very carefully, because as I say, homeworking has historically always been associated with women, has always been associated with, you know, the flexible option for workers who, um, you know, who can't uh, conform to the standard employment model of full-time continuous work on site. So, those were slightly incoherent thoughts, but perhaps they sort of managed to link together some of, some of the themes that we've been talking about. Fantastic. Um, so here's a question for anyone on the panel who'd like to take it. And this is staying with the theme of sort of the impact of uh, these trends on, on society. Um, the question comes from Douglas who asks, what do you predict will be the effect upon the long-term employment rate over the next 20 years of increasingly skilled knowledge-based professions having 90% or more of their work being able to be done faster and better by expert systems, costing the same or less to use than the average available employee? That's something I obviously thought about myself. Uh, and it's, you know, we like to make fun of uh, the idea of Luddites, people who resisted the idea of automation in the, in the 19th century, because you know, we know historically that um, people were able to move into different fields, technology opened up new opportunities, but one might worry, and I think this is perhaps an underlying part of the question, that this process can't go on indefinitely. As more and more jobs are able to be done better by AIs, can we realistically expect people to shift into, a, into a new, new niches and opportunities? So uh, I'm not sure, it, would anyone like to take that or multiple people? I can start um, because I probably have a reasonably, I think very little. I think uh, we've seen particularly, I think the, the depressing thing about these arguments is it's the professions that are bleating about this. And the professions are in a position to bleat about this. And they unfortunately that no one asked the coal miners about this when they were pushed out of work and pushed into call centers and had devastating effects that we're feeling the consequences of today. Professional workers, this has already happened to them. Who's a stockbroker anymore? No one. Did you see a stockbroker on the street? No, you didn't. They found other jobs. And the number of jobs is infinite because fundamentally we love social interaction. And with the, with the worries that Helen's mentioning, which are very big worries, I think there's a what, bigger worry that you'll end up split into a society of people that hang around in coffee shops doing things for, to please each other or watching football or doing leisure things. And then another portion of society that's sort of um, having to provide the fodder for these AI machines and you'll get a split in society. But the idea that there's gonna be mass employment, I think is ridiculous. I mean, the UK doesn't produce anything productive today, yet we had until COVID near full employment. Uh, employment isn't about productivity and the things we need to do. It's about just occupying ourselves. And you know, you actually have to go to somewhere like uh, Africa or South America to find places where people are doing work that's about survival rather than works about, that is mainly about pleasure. I, I would also say that you know, the, the narratives that are spun around uh, jobless futures are really hard to take seriously. Um, there is no science of the future. I, 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 with all due respect to machine learning experts and economists and uh, alike, um, we can actually make choices with these things. And I think a lot of time when we talk about the future of work, we talk it as something that is happening to us like the weather. It is not something that we can actively shape or make choices about. Um, and I think that this country is a prime example. I mean, there was mention of Luddites and I uh, talked about the spinning Jenny. Um, the last industrial revolution was certainly great for Britain as a nation, but it was a primary cause of what we call the North-South divide. Um, indeed, places in the North, which were the manufacturing heartlands, the textile factories in Manchester in the North, were the places hardest hit by this. And if you look at these northern communities that have been atomized by the last industrial revolution, I don't think they've really re recovered from the effects of automation in the mechanical sense. And I don't think it's a coincidence that if you overlay a map of the places where the Luddite rebellions and the swing riots took place with a, pla a map of uh, Brexit votes, that the places that voted most overwhelmingly in favor of Brexit are still those communities that are feeling the effects of a hundred years of economic disadvantage. So 
if we don't want to repeat those mistakes, if we don't want to per, you know, further this north-south divide, and as a Canadian who has lived in Manchester and Cambridge, I've seen both sides a little bit, um, we have to actually push back against the inevitability of all of this. I mean, a lot of these things that are coming and predictions that are being made are being made by management companies and firms who predict all of us being out of jobs except management consultants, which is funny how that works. Um, but I think the culture and attitude of conversations around automation has to become one of active engagement, not one of just passive acquiescence. We can make choices to prioritize and ensure 100% or something close to full employment. Um, it's, it, it is folly otherwise to imagine that we, we have no control over the decisions we make in terms of R&D, national investment or otherwise. Fantastic, thank you. I'm afraid we're running a little over time, so we've only got time now for one final question. I'm sorry to everyone who didn't get their questions answered. Um, the final question I wanted, to, I wanted to make sure we answered is one that sort of targets more international issues, which haven't sort of been primarily the focus so far. Um, this comes from an anonymous at attendee who asks, if AI is of any use in, um, in getting justice and language is the intermediary between applying the letter of the law and the spirit of the law, is the extent of its potential use affected by which language or culture the justice is delivered in? For example, Spanish or Chinese or English or Arabic. Christopher, I take it that um, primarily to you, but if any of the other panelists want to chime in on um, these broader international issues and how AI, AI may affect different linguistic and cultural communities differently, that would be a, this would be a great opportunity. So Christopher, do you I, want to start us off? I could certainly say that is the forefront of what I'm doing right now with my research. So uh, we're, there are cultural differences and the role of cultural has a differential effect on legal culture itself. So right now I'm working on a three-year project with colleagues in Japan uh, comparing Japanese legal culture to uh, English common law. Um, there are massive differences. There are certainly you know, differences to language that uh, cause problems in terms of it transforming or def uh, making it defeasible into computation. Um, there are unique uh, issues with uh, doing NLP in, across domains, but there's also a, a longstanding problem of uh, how we sort of harmonize law internationally, how we come up with equivalents for concepts and ideas that don't exist. And you know, Japan is a really interesting example for a number of reasons. Number one of the primary ones being is whereas the criminal courts in the UK deal with hundreds of thousands of cases on a year, we have a you know fairly high crime rate. Um, very few cases go to trial in Japan. There's this odd phenomenon that people tend to confess to crimes far more readily uh, than than other people do. Now, this seems to be a facet of like underlying uh, cultural factors of honor and shame. But it means that we have a lot less data about certain jurisdictions, about certain types of cases, uh, because of the nature of the, the offense or the issue at hand. Um, but to the question, uh, whether language as an intermediary is a better medium for conducting law, um, I think a lot of this has to turn on whether we see language as a biologically ingrained component or something that we have sort of appropriated along the way. If it's biologically ingrained, then there might be reason to argue that at least it levels the playing field if we all have a shared medium to engage in law with. Fantastic, thank you. I, we are over time, but if any, any of, would any of the other panelists like to chime in on this issue briefly? I think it's okay. Okay, great. Fantastic. Okay, in that case, let me say uh, thank you very much um, to everyone for joining us today and to our fantastic speakers and for the really interesting selection of questions. Obviously, there's a lot more to be said on this topic, um, but I'm amazed at how much we've managed to get through. Um, if you'd like to learn more about our speakers' interests and research, you can follow them on Twitter. I believe their Twitter handles should be pasted in the, posted in the chat um, shortly, or you can access their academic homepages with a full list of their research and publications. Um, all of which are available on our website. So once again, thank you all for joining us. I hope you enjoy the remaining se sessions of the festival. I'm Henry Shevlin. Goodbye. <laughs>